has been going on for a while now. In this last uh, session in Ramadan, and, uh, and as usual, we try to to remind ourselves about what brought us here. What are we trying to do? And then sometimes we talk, discuss some uh, of the points that we uh, discuss in Jumu'ah, so that we can have uh, an opportunity for interactive. Uh, discussion because Jama is one-way communication. So, basically, um, the first thing that brought us here together is uh, we figured out, or it's becoming very obvious that there is something that is seriously wrong in terms of um, the way we understand our faith and the way we practice it, and and that can be reflected or can be. Uh, the clearest indication is the situation of Muslims everywhere. Uh, I mean, we can put our heads in the sand and say it's um, it's going to be it, it will go away, it will be fixed, and it's and then we can find somebody to blame and we can find excuses. But all of this is not going to fix it. And the Quran teaches us a methodology that when something goes wrong, blame only yourself. That's what the Quran tells the Prophet وسلم, after the battle of Ahud. Uh, after the battle of Ahud, actually, it's, uh, it's, been, it's, it's even more explicit. When things go wrong, you have to learn to blame yourself. Because when you blame yourself, you can fix it. <coughs> As long you are in denial, as long you are still continue to find excuses, as long you continue to justify failure, you're going to go nowhere. You know, still the situation will be as is or even gets worse. So trying to find out what went wrong uh, led us that actually a very simple conclusion, that the situation of Muslims will never change until Muslims themselves change, until we, we change, as long as we are we have the same mindset, the same way, we think the same way, we do things the same way, then the results are going to be the same. Uh, time here is not the solution. Time is not part of the solution. Time becomes part of the solution when you are on the right track and doing the right thing. Then with time, things will work. But if you are off track, actually time sometimes becomes a problem because with time, things are getting worse. Why? Because we are off track. So things will not change until we do. And we will not change until our understanding of Islam changes, until we find and discover the true Islam, the, the great faith of ours, the very inspiring and empowering faith that generated something uh, incredible in history. Yeah, I, I'm, there is an author called, uh, whose name is uh, Karen uh, Armstrong. She keeps saying this. She, she wrote a lot about Muslims and the Prophet Sallallahu etc. Very objective. Yeah. But one of the things that she keeps saying that it's uh, that the story of Muslims is a success story. I mean, their Prophet is something who did, who someone did something great. Uh, and she's wondering why we are not inspired by it. Why we, we have this complacency and accept to be average and etc. Even though the story of our faith and our prophet is a success story. And she compares it to Christians. Say at the end of the, at the day, she is Christian. At the end of the day, Christians, their prophet, ended up crucified as they believe. So it was like, like a failure. But these are, have a success story. Yet they don't seem to be inspired or motivated to do something great even though all their history is uh, it's very inspiring and full of success, especially their prophet, who everybody agrees that he was the greatest 
leader and the one who led the greatest change in history. Uh, that's consensus. I mean, the most influential person in history of humanity was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu with the amount of change that he, he affected. So we started this journey trying to discover this Islam that generated that success story. And in this journey, we found out that the gap between the true Islam and the Islam as practiced today and understood is huge. It's a huge gap. I mean, you can see it with the results, uh, the kind of people that Islam produced, the kind of change that Islam, the true Islam, uh, affected, compared to and with a small number of people and with limit, very limited resources and in very unfavorable conditions and now you have billion and a half Muslim and they don't seem to be able to get anything done right yet. It's a totally marginal, very irrelevant, uh, big, big image problem, uh, severe image problem, etc. So, and alhamdulillah, yani we, we came to the point, even though it's very painful, it's very painful to acknowledge that the problem is deep. We always want to believe that it is superficial. It can go away with some painkillers. So to admit that the problem is very deep, it's painful. But it is very uh, fulfilling the, when, you have, when you come up with the proper diagnosis. As much as, as painful as it is, as is, but also gives you hope that now you can fix the problem because you put your, your fingers on the roots of it. Uh, it's not going to be easy, etc. But at least we start, we stop this decline and we start rebounding. That's all what we need. Now we know this may take generations, but what, what we want to achieve as, as soon as possible is to stop this decline and to start rebounding so that every generation will uh, move things on the right track and make situation better than the generation before. So this is where we are. One of the things that we discovered very early on, that this deen is essentially a mission. And every piece of this deen is connected to that mission. It's the foundation, it's the heart, it's the engine, you name it. If, it is, if Islam is building, the mission is the foundation. If Islam is a human, it's a body, the mission is the heart. If it is a vehicle, the mission is the engine. So we take that away and the whole thing collapses. Because everything in this deen is connected to that. Including the ibadat, including the ibadat. This month that we are fasting was meant to empower people who are on a mission. That's the meaning of Ramadan. The moment Muslims abandoned their mission, it became very obsolete, routine, cultural event. That's why people nowadays, you see it in many parts of the Muslim world, or the majority of Muslims, the way they approach Ramadan is totally wrong. People waste more time, watch more TV, they do stuff in Ramadan, amazing. They spend much more time on food, etc. It's everything against what, is, what this month is meant to be. Why? Because it was detached from its purpose. So now it is, it became a cultural or a routine event. And same thing goes for prayer and the same thing goes for everything that is prescribed in this deen was meant to support and empower, as I mentioned in Jumu'ah, the ibadat in particular. They are meant to do, two, to do two things. One is to express feelings, your love of Allah, your fear of Allah, your dependence, you express through ibadat. Second, these ibadat or worship acts are meant to empower you, to empower someone who is on a mission. And we have seen the verse in Surah al muzammi clearly. It starts by, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And then say, إِنَّنَا شِئِنَّا سَنُلْقِ عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا So why you, you are asked to stay up and pray at night? Because you're going to carry a very huge mission or message that we're going to reveal to you. And then the verse continues to say, إِنَّ نَشِئَةَ اللَّيْلِ هِيَ أَشَدُّ وَطْمًا وَأَقْوَى مُقِيلًا That's the best training and the best preparation for someone who's on a mission. Take the mission away, this whole thing becomes very obsolete. 
I mean, so Islam is essentially in, is a mission, <coughs> mission. And then we talked about the details of this mission, that it is a mission of Islah, it is a mission of Amar, development, reform, establishing justice. That's, that's what Muslims commit to when they come to this deen. They commit to, make, to execute the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's what Allah likes for his uh, servant, uh, which is uh, for justice to prevail, for people to, li to live in peace, for people to prosper, for people to realize their potential, etc. That's, this is the goal. That's when you come to Islam, you commit to, to, make, to contribute to the best of your ability to make these goals happen. So, and this is what something that we, we kept emphasizing, that coming to Islam involves or entails commitment to goals, not to tasks. Why? Because that, why this is important? Because if I'm committed to tasks, then as long as I'm doing them, I don't care. That's the, the attitude of majority of Muslims today. I'm, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm doing what I need to do, I'm staying away from haram, khalas. the rest is not my problem. Because that's what Islam had, that's how it was presented, that's how people accepted it. And that's why people don't have even guilt feeling. They see the situation is deteriorating and etc. And then they, because they, 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 the way Islam was introduced to them is a list of tasks to do, list of tasks to avoid. You do that, you, you, have, you, you do these tasks, you avoid those, you're going to be in Jannah. Allah will be pleased with you, don't worry about anything else. And as I said also many times that in our mind, who is the ideal Muslim? The one who is uh, isolated, uh, doesn't do haram, which is good. So, but we never ask about what is this con the contribution of this person. I mean, what did this person contribute? No, we ask that what, what, it, what, is, what the person is abstaining from. So Islam is a passive thing. So even if this person is not contributing anything, we still consider that this is a very pious taqi. Why? Because he is someone who is uh, isolated, does not interact with the environment, doesn't do haram, always is in, in state of worship, etc. So the, even in, 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 in our minds, the idea of uh, or the, the, the profile of an ideal Muslim is, was gone totally wrong. Uh, uh, what is now ask Muslims, average Muslim tell them to introduce their deen to you explain Islam to, them, to you most people are unable to do it and most people are going to end up basically um, trying to put some pieces together but unable to to explain their religion to people and if they do, they are going to explain it in a very superficial way. They are going to go fall to say, oh, Islam is, uh, you need to pray five times and you need to uh, stay, don't uh, drink. And don't. That's not what Islam is. I mean, most of these things came very late. That's not what Islam, how Islam was introduced. So there is a lot of work that is needed for us to, di to discover our faith and then to... Uh, to come to it from the same door from which the companions of Rasul came to this deen. They came to this deen as a life mission. They committed themselves fully to it. Ya ayyul ladina amanu dkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter in this deen wholeheartedly. In Islam wholeheartedly. Not something on the side. It's gonna, it has to become something that paints all aspects of, of your life. But the good news is that that faith that, did, that produced this great results in a very unfavorable conditions is capable to do it all the time, provided there are people who understand it properly, take it seriously, commit to it fully. Sdeen is about commitment. It's about commitment to a mission that will make you very motivated and very restless until you see that dream or that vision that is explained in Quran and in the Sunnah of Rasul and you, until you see it a reality, until you see that as a reality. That's what Rasul did, by the way. 
Rasul in Mecca, he committed companions to a mission and to a dream or vision. We call it vision nowadays. Why this is not clear in the hadith of Rasul Why there is no mission and vision, etc., in the hadith of Rasul And there is not detailed talk about this. And one of the reasons I found is that because people mastered the Arabic language at that time, they didn't need a lot of details. The word Allah or La ilaha illallah, uh, these words, they carry a lot of weight at that time. They were not taken lightly. So these people, because they mastered the Arabic language, they didn't need a lot of explanation. And remember the story of the shepherd. And Ra'i, shepherd, asked the Rasul what are you calling for? And why people are, um, why people are opposing you and persecuting you? It said, what's going on here? So Rasul Sallallahu said, I'm calling people to say, Shadu an la ilaha illallah, wa na Muhammad Rasulullah. Just imagine this happening now. I mean, everybody said, very simple. Everybody can say that. So why, what's the problem? So the shepherd said, Allah la tuqatilannaka al-arabu wal-ajab. Everybody is going to fight you over this. Why? Because this shepherd understood this meaning of, when you declare a shahada, meaning what? Meaning everybody is going to submit. Meaning people are equal. Meaning there is no more privilege. Meaning there is big change is going to happen. So all of these thoughts came to him. Just from the word of Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. So immediately, immediately he figured out that this is going to be opposed by everybody. You're coming to introduce big change. And he, he is society that is tribal and there are people who are masters and the slaves, etc. And you're coming to say, Everybody's going to be worshipping one God and everybody's going to be equal and everybody's surrendering. No, it's not going to go easily. So that's an example of how uh, the word, the statement of Shahada at that time was very loaded word. People immediately. That's why the, those who came to Islam, they were very serious. And those who opposed it, they also were very serious at that time. Nobody took this lightly. Nobody took this casually or lightly because that statement of Shahada is very, everything that we're, we're talking about is there. Everything we're talking about in Islam, it's there. It's, it's, it's roots is in that Shahada. And those who understood, that's why, as I said, those who came to Islam, they gave it their life and those who, who fought it, they also fought it very hard. Why? Because they understood where this is leading. This is a revolution. That's a big movement of change. Uh, they understood the goals of this deen from that, from that child. A couple of things about what we discussed on Friday, inshallah, so that I get, leave the floor for you. Uh, one of the things is that not only we approach Ramadan the wrong way, but also we leave it the wrong way. And for the majority of Muslims, for the majority of Muslims, their mind is programmed to do what? Just after four days, go back. Go back as if nothing happened. Yani Ramadan will become a like commercial break. There is a program and we had a commercial and now we go back to the continue the program. That's the vast majority of Muslims around the world. Are they bad people? No. That's what they were told. That's the way they were told. That from during Ramadan, you become a better person. Maybe. But after Ramadan, it's over. You go back the same person as you were before Ramadan. So it's a mindset that has to be fixed. And, and unless we change that, and we realize that Ramadan was meant to push you to new higher level or new heights so that you can stay there you can stay as much as possible and as long as possible after Ramadan so it's basically Ramadan you know there is a practice in the Middle East I don't think they do it people here you know sometimes cars they don't start they push them no no they push them they stick shift they push them they push them so that the car starts and then continue on its own. Where Ramadan was meant to be that pushing. Ramadan was meant for you to push you so that your, your, your own battery and engine starts. 
So that after Ramadan you will, you will fly and you go. Not you, uh, once people start pushing, you stop. Yani. So it's, that's what it meant. And for those who like science, you know the pumps, they pump water. You prime it. They prime it. They fill them with water first. So that it can uh, do the job. That's Ramadan. It's a priming. It's like the priming the pump or pushing the car so that you can start on, on your own. Now imagine you approach it this way. It's a big difference. Now is it going to be easy to stay at that level? No, it's not going to be easy. Make no mistake about it. But at least, I mean, put a fight. I mean, don't make the job of shaitan easy. Because shaitan is going to succeed with the majority of Muslims. Tuesday night, people will go back to their pre-Ramadan performance and level. And they don't wait even for eight day. Uh, as I said, it's not because people are not good people. People are, you can see them. People are filling the mosque and people are very dedicated. But that's, a, that's the way they were told. That's the way they understood this month. So I was talking in Jumu'ah that, no, we need to be prepared for transition. And they kept emphasizing this concept of transition, that a lot of time you know, we fail in transition. And we fail in transition, why? Because we don't plan ahead. Because a lot of time transition catch, catches us and prepared. And they mentioned examples. I mentioned the movements for independence liberation movements in many Muslim countries. Great movements. But because there was nothing planned after independence, we ended up with almost failed state. I mentioned recently the Arab Spring. Very inspiring. Topple regimes, nothing was planned afterwards, it ended up into disaster. Hey, let's come here. The campaigns to establish Islamic Center in this country was a great campaign. And the Muslim did something wonderful job to establish Islamic Center. A lot of motivation and, and passion and unity at that time and diversity, you name it. But because there was nothing planned beyond the Islamic Center, the moment we have our center, things stagnated, all the problems came to surface, and then people start fighting for the control of the mosque. I mean, because there was nothing planned there. Now, let's take it even for families. You know, family life goes into stages. And people get married, and then there are children, and then children become teenagers. So these are phases. Majority of Muslim families, they are not prepared. They don't plan for these phases ahead. So they are caught and prepared. By the time they discover their child became teenager, it's still going to be too late. I mean, they were not preparing for that, for that transition. There is transition. Uh, so, on Tuesday, there is a big transition that's going to happen for us. Why? Because the whole mood and the atmosphere is not going to be there. That was helping us. You come to the mosque, find it full of people. The whole atmosphere is very conducive and very encouraging. You're not going to, now you're on, on your own. So the, the pushing will, will stop. Um, mentally, many people are not prepared. Uh, so we have to think of it as there is transition. As I said in Jumu'ah, if you don't have a plan, Shaitan has, does. And I can tell you the plan of Shaitan is very simple. is to bring you down as quickly as possible so that you are the same person like before Ramadan. So before and after is the same thing. That's the plan of Shaitan. If you don't have a plan, he has a plan. And his plan is going to work, of course. If you are not, if you are not going to put a resistance, if you don't have a plan of yours, if there is only one plan, of course it's going to work. So that's why I recommend it for all of us that we condition ourselves, that now we're going to be, uh, we're going to transition to a different game. We worked so hard for those games, we now try to preserve them. So starting from Tuesday night, I can, if I was coming to Aisha and Taraweeh, I will force myself to come. Even if it is not well, convenient or it's not the usual way, why? So that I can make it clear that I'm not, I'm resisting. I'm not gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna surrender. Um, there is no taraweeh in the masjid. I go home, pray a couple of rakats. Uh, as soon as possible, start fasting the six days. 
So the message will be very clear. This time I'm resisting. This time I'm going to defend my gains. I'm not going to uh, give them up easily. So shaitan will realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan gives us opportunity to, make, to gain a lot of yards. If you're going to think of it as a football game. Uh, we're going to make shaitan fight very hard for every inch. So we're not going to allow him to push us back very quickly to where we were before Ramadan. No. So just put, condition yourself to do this. The way your relationship with the Quran will continue inshallah the same. Um, challenge yourself and push yourself. Now, just to tell you something, linking this to the important importance of the mission of Islam. You know the level of motivation we have now? That's the level that the companions had all year long. Not because of Ramadan. Because of this power, motivational power of this mission. The motivation that we have because of Ramadan, the mission of Islam, gives you much more motivation, bigger. I'll tell you why. Now why we're doing all of what we're trying to do in Ramadan? Why are we pushing ourselves? What, what's motivating us? Motivating mostly rewards. So opportunity to, so to get rewards for us, so Allah will be pleased with us. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says about the companions تَتَّجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِهِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمْعًا They are... Uh, they're seeking uh, what's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're fearing. Khawfana tam'an of what? And again, I'm trying to establish, uh, make the case that the mission of Islam is much bigger motivator than even Ramadan. And if you have a mission, one, you want to fulfill it to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala same way like we are doing what we're doing in Ramadan. Two, it's so noble, the mission, and so pressing on your mind because there is a dream that you want to see as a reality. That's not here in Ramadan. I mean, you don't have that part in Ramadan. In Ramadan, you have an opportunity to gather as many rewards as possible. That's why you stay up late at night and you do all what you're doing. So it's an opportunity to gather Rewards. You still have that in fulfilling the mission. You are also motivated by gaining rewards. But you are motivating by other things. One is there is a dream that you want to see as a reality. Two, you are always concerned that you may not be doing enough. That you may not be doing enough for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe still I can do more. So, the level of motivation, the attitude of Muslims in Ramadan that you see, if Muslims discover the true Islam and commit to it as a mission, that should be the same level of motivation and the same attitude all year long. Why? In addition to everything I mentioned. This, this, this mission is so huge. It, it drives you strongly to come closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking help and guidance and everything. And it is so huge that it drives people to one another. So when Islam talks about unity and talks about brotherhood, that's not uh, an abstract concept. This mission of Islam works like a glue. It's so demanding that it drives you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because you need all the help and all the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do this job properly. It's a big job. Two, it is so demanding and so big that it drives people towards one another. That's why when Islam talks about unity and talks about brotherhood and sisterhood, Islam has a model to do it. Islam has a way, has, has, has a methodology on how to, and we now talk about as an abstract. We talk so much about unity and so much about brotherhood and Islam and sisterhood. It's in reality, there is nothing. Why? It's not reflected in reality because Islam make these things happen because when, when, when Islam commits people 
to its mission, everything will follow. Even spirituality, by the way. Even spirituality. Rasul Sallallahu when he was staying uh, all night long and praying, he was not only doing it for rewards. Because one of the description of the companions was what? كَانُوا رَهْبَانًا بِاللَّيْلِ فُرْسَانًا بِالنَّهَارِ if there is someone who stays, stays up at night to do what? To harness energy and help and support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they spend it during the day. They used to, they were described as monks at night. And Ruhbana bil And nights for Sanan bin Nahar. That's their life. It is because of what they do during the day that they need energy at night they need to harness that so part of it was not just because you can seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different ways but staying up at night and praying and <clears throat> begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was needed because these people were on a mission and the mission of Islam believe it believe me it will make you restless all year long so Ramadan will become an extra credit it's an extra motivation it's not like Ramadan comes to find someone who is totally demotivated and then just motivate you for a month and then you lose it no Ramadan will be the extra the extra push that you are someone who is motivated all year long you get maintenance energy from the prayer you get some energy from the extra deeds that you do like night prayer but then you have this season of Ramadan where you really push you to a different height in terms of energy, in terms of strength, in terms of your ability to restrain yourself, etc. So, uh, so Ramadan, as I said, will not be appreciated except by people who are on a mission. Then they will realize they will be waiting for it. Why? Because in the same way that you come to prayers, seeking the help of Allah and the guidance, and the support so that you do that job that he assigned to do assigned it's like and when the line it's like an employee going to his boss or advisor seeking seeking guidance and seeking help it's a, it's a job that you're doing Allah assigned us this job we need that support and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa and also to acknowledge that we're not doing enough and part of going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to thank him for his everything that he has given us to seek his forgiveness and his help and his guidance and his protection and also to acknowledge that we're not doing enough I mean no Muslim should feel at any moment that they are doing enough and they know enough we are always learning and we are always trying to grow and to improve and the way to every one of us should evaluate himself or herself I mentioned by three things basically one is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's first and foremost two your growth and your improvement three your impact and your contribution when you evaluate yourself how good of a Muslim you are these are the criteria your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reflects in the quality of your worship and uh, to what extent you are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Two, your growth, your, your, your improvement. Are you someone who is constantly learning, constantly growing, constantly shaping up, or you are the same person one week in, one month out, etc. You are the same person. That's three, what is your impact and what's your contribution? What difference are you making? What difference are you making in the lives of people around you? What difference are you making in the, in the conditions in which you're living? Are you a difference maker? or somebody who is just here to make a living. And Muslims by design, they are designed to make a difference, not just to fit or to make, to make, to make a living. They are, they are this, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةً أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ yani they, they were de designated to be some difference makers. The people, when, wherever they settle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe believers, الَّذِينَ إِنْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ What do they do? أقاموا الصلاة 
وآتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونهوا عن المنكر. Whatever they settle, that's what they do. They establish prayer, they pay zakat, they enjoin that which is good and forbid that which is evil. What does it mean they to enjoy? They make things better. Whatever they settle, anything that is good, they promote it. And they try to minimize anything that is bad. Whatever they settle. That's the nature of believers. So when you see a community of believers who stays for years and decades in a place where it has no impact, then we have to question our understanding of this deen. Because this deen, by nature, makes people impactful. This deen is deen of change. How does it do it? It changes individuals and turns them into agents of change in their environment, in their circles. And then brings them together. Islam has a model to bring people together to affect change in the whole society. That's what, when Islam stops doing this, then what you have is something else. It's a, it's a, it's a mission and message of change. Changes individuals. Transform individuals. The true Islam was uh, and made complete transformation in its followers. And again, I strongly recommend to read the stories of companions before and after Islam. You will realize what this deen is about. It's a complete transformation. It was not something on the side. Someone who started thinking differently, their priority became differently. Now they're living for, they, were, they used to live for themselves. Now they're living for Allah and for a cause. And that's a big transformation. So that's Islam, transforms individuals and then turns them into agents of <coughs> change in their circles. And then Islam has a model to bring people to build the community, bring people together so that they can affect change in the society at large. Anytime you don't see these chains, these, uh, this chain, then you have to question the, your understanding of this thing or your commitment to it. Either way, it's either a problem of understanding or a problem we know what needs to be done and we're not doing it. It's a problem of understanding or a problem of commitment. And you're going to have to fix it until you start seeing these results. Now, these results don't happen overnight, but at least you are on the right track. You can tell. How you can tell, as I said, by your growth and improvement as an individual and as a community and by your impact. Things are not going to change overnight and things are not going to change easily. But there is a big difference between being on the right, on the right track as individuals and as a community and doing the right thing and progressing or being totally off track. Right now, now we reach a situation that is very serious. Very serious. I, I hope nobody is fooling himself that about the seriousness of this uh, situation now. You're going to have generation of Muslims. We have nothing done about this situation. You're going to have generation of Muslims who probably will be self-hated Muslims. They're going to be concealing their identity because there is nothing that will make them proud. That's what people are not realizing. And we start seeing signs of it in this country here. Now we're putting our heads in the sand because we, that's, we were trained to, 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 be, to, to face problems with denial because it's very, uh, very convenient. I mean, you see, a problem doesn't exist. Just look the other way. But the problem is not going to go away. It's there. Whether you deny it, whether you try to justify it, whether you come up with excuses, whether you uh, think that or you try to belittle the problem, none of this will, will, do, will fix it. There is only one way to fix problems. Proper diagnosis and taking charge and taking responsibility. Things happen because of what we do and because of what we fail to do. Things that don't happen by coincidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rules that govern this universe. The physical part of it and also the human part. Things happen because things are happening now because of what, of what we did and because of what we failed to do. And because what we failed to do in time. Because a lot of time you know, we do things but we come late. 
because the issue of timing is not critical for us. We can just come, but if you don't do things on time, doing it later sometimes will be irrelevant. So accepting situation, taking charge, and trying to get to the bottom of it. And I'm, I think the only way we can turn things around that that's possible. One is to accept the severity of the situation. Two, to come up with a proper diagnosis, which as I said, there is nothing short of going back to the roots and coming up with a fresh understanding of Islam. An understanding that will fulfill the goals of Islam, maqasid, without violating the thawabit or the essence or the constant of this deen. So we start holding ourselves accountable for the results. Not we're happy just because I'm, I'm doing a number of tasks and, and I'm, I'm done. No. Start holding yourself accountable for, for the results, for the, for the outcome. Um, if we do it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, promised, um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps His promises. Very simple. If you do the, the right thing, you do things right, you do everything you can, then what? Then you can count on the help, on the help of Allah. And that's it's, it's decisive help. Decisive means it will it will seal it. This is how we, we were designated. We need to refresh our mind. No, we, were not, we were not designed to be in the back seat. We were not designed to be marginal. So this idea of complacency that it's okay to be average, it just as long as we have the minimum, and we are, we are adopting this uh, mindset now in everything we do. It's okay to be average, it's okay to be, uh, it's okay even to fail. Now that's not what we were designated to do. Now we're designated to be a model community and a leading community. And we have to uh, start dreaming about big goals, because that's only big goals motivates people. This maintenance things and to get by, that doesn't motivate people. You know, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was in Mecca, he was talking to people about the castles of Persia. And people were not, don't, don't have something to eat at that time. I mean, only big dreams motivates people. So we have to start thinking about the zone because we have a masjid and we have some basic service, so it should be okay. Alhamdulillah, we're growing and the masjid is um, getting more and more people. We used to have one Jumu'ah, now we have two or three, and we should be happy. No, 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 we shouldn't. No, we should, as I said, talk about what, what's, what's the profile that Allah chose for us and try to meet those expectations. Quran describes the community of believers as what? As a model and leading community. Not because of who, you, who we are. No, we're not the selected people. No, no. Because of what we do. There's a big difference. Because if it is because of what we are, then we can relax and we are the best. No. It's because of what you do. That's why when Quran says you are the best of communities, it didn't say because of who you are. Because of what you do. And then, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ مَتَمُصَّةً لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So you are special community, not because of, of your ethnicity, or your nationality, or where you are born, no, no. You are a special community because of that mission that Allah has designed you to carry. It's the same mission that Allah sent prophets for it. So it's very noble. It's the same mission that was assigned to people before us and they failed. And that's why Quran talks about them extensively. To tell us don't do the same thing. Because there are people before you, you took a job, it used to be assigned to somebody else, he was fired. Why he was fired? Because they didn't do it right. So this is what these people have done. Just in case you, so that you know that that's what you should, you should avoid, you shouldn't do. That's why Quran extensively talk about Bani Israel. Why? Because these are the people who were assigned this mission before you. 
just to tell you what are the traps that you should avoid. So that's the performance of the people who took this, this job before you. Unfortunately, the Quran has, Quran describes extensively the story of a community that, who was assigned this mission and failed. And then Quran describes extensively the profile of the community who is supposed to carry this mission. And we should be working hard to meet those criteria. Now, our situation now, actually it's much closer to the failure. To the failure. And I see a lot of things that Quran mentions about Bani Israel applies to Muslims nowadays. And the things that we were told to avoid um, were almost, we're doing it the opposite. Yani we're, we're, we're executing the, the instructions in, in the wrong way. Whatever we are supposed to avoid. And then the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is what you're, su you're supposed to be. That's who you are. That's what you're supposed to be doing. This is something that we are not paying attention to it. And unfortunately, we're falling uh, in the traps that we were told to, to avoid. So let me stop here, uh, because next time, inshallah, we'll be meeting after Ramadan. Make sure that transition goes as smooth as possible. Uh, this is our job to remind each other so that, inshallah, we sail through, through this transition smoothly. As I said, condition yourself, because there will be what they called in football, uh, blitz blitzer. Oh, nobody understands football. Blitz it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what Shaitan is going to do. <laughs> gonna, they're going to come full attack. As I said, has one goal. Bring you down as fast as possible. Preferably for Shaitan, Tuesday. <laughs> and you finish iftar Tuesday night. 9 o'clock Tuesday, you are the same person one month ago. I mean, in terms of what you do and what you think and what, etc. That's the goal of Shaitan. Now, at least, let's put a fight. I mean, let's resist. And, as I said, force ourselves. Tuesday night, you come to the masjid. For Aisha, even if there is no taraweeh, do some taraweeh at home. Wednesday, do some of the things that you were doing in Ramadan. Start to resume the fasting as quickly as possible. The six days of Shawa, etc. At least... Make it clear that not this time. Not this time. This time is, in, I mean, I worked so hard for these. This is my capital now. That's my capital, and I'm not going to give it away easily. So I'm going to try to defend it because we worked so hard. I mean, many people uh, were deprived of sleeping during Ramadan. Many people pushed themselves beyond their limit, etc. It would be very silly to do all of this work and then to lose it. Uh, so quickly. Yeah. All right, the floor is yours, inshallah. And then if we have time, we'll do some tafsir, inshallah, as usual. Now, we welcome brothers. Please introduce yourself uh, after we made the call in Jamu'ah. Brother uh, Mazen, right? Mazen. Mazen Badr. Mazen Badr. Mazen Badr. Sami, Sami, Amen. Sami. 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 Oh, I don't know. The brother Basil. 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 I welcome every brother. Again, as I said in Jumu'ah, we are now transitioning, inshallah, hopefully from next week. We're probably going to discuss this if we can meet either after Dhuhr or we can make the shorten the class and have part of it as a meeting format which means basically we're going to start asking the tough question of how to turn this into reality. I mean, uh, and alhamdulillah, uh, I mean, this last week I was surprised in a very positive way, last couple of weeks. I came to know a few brothers, and uh, I was am amazed at how much talents we have in this community. I mean, uh, believe it or not, there are people who can contribute so much to this project and uh, beyond what we think. This community is full of talents, dedicated people, etc. We just there was no vision, there was no project for people to to contribute to it. Hopefully that will change inshallah. And already I heard some lot of good ideas from from some people here. Yes. Uh, what shall I call you? Uh, 
Brother Samir, yes. Sheikh Sifat. Um, anything. Uh, of course, you, 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 uh, you are a teacher and you are a preacher also. And the people who are here are pulling, of course, to listen and they apply what, what, what you uh, preach on. And you said the relationship with God, the growth improvement uh, of Muslims, and then the impact of this. And this is the, the core of, of my question here. Do you think is the uh, leadership failed to transform the Muslims in this century, in this country, in this area? No, no, we have so, very... Because I, I have the evidence here, and we talk about the science, and I'm a science teacher. Oh. So, it's, uh, uh, the, I don't see uh, many Muslims here uh, from the, those who have the, those making impact, making the difference, those doctors and engineers and lawyers. And we, have, we have, I don't know how many, how many people do we have here. Muslims who are qualified people. Where are they? Where are the youth here? Uh, do are we are we as 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 leaders here? Uh, we are you know succeeding in, 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 in this mission here, transform them into this this uh, time, this century, this uh, country, this area, which is fast area in comparison of course to the others. Are we doing okay? We have very severe leadership problem. Historically, this is a chronical problem among Muslims. We have very severe leadership problem. And the reason for that, the main reason for this, in addition to the fact that we abandoned the mission of Islam that was making leaders, what was producing leaders in the early days of Islam is this mission. When people commit to it, it makes them leaders. That's why. Most of the companions were leaders. I mean, were not born leaders. Some of them were slaves. But this mission of Islam is the one that transformed them into leaders. Part of it is that, and part of it, and we lived under dictatorship for so long. And the dictatorship, the first thing that it does, it suppresses initiative and leadership, etc. So it kills that. Actually, it makes people very coward and make people hypocrite even. And because under dictatorship, uh, the people people succeed not by the by the merit, succeed by crooked ways. I mean, if the dictator is pleased with you, and if you uh, uh, then you can become the next leader, or you can uh, be drawn to the leadership circle, but not because of what you have. So again. Bottom line, forget about all the reasons. We have very severe leadership problem. Now, we have two options. We can be waiting for a leader to come. That's not going to happen. As our, our culture now it's not, does not produce leaders. Our cultures, the culture we have doesn't produce leaders because it doesn't encourage leadership. It can, encourages conformity, not, not initiative and leadership. Or we can collectively start looking or look for the right path and start taking that journey and hopefully this work will produce or will cultivate and groom new leaders or new breed of leadership because the traditional leadership have failed Muslims everywhere in the world unfortunately and we tried almost all ideologies and all groups and all parties and everything and None of them work. Sorry for interruption, but doesn't, don't you think that's impact uh, uh, Islam itself? It's impacting. Uh, and then if I am you know, having a bad leadership here and we are not making difference, then I say is, uh, why am I Muslim? Yeah. I'm going to leave this religion. That's what many young people are thinking and doing. But, I mean, that's our reality. You know, you don't choose your reality. That's our reality. I mean, we wish that we were born at a time where we had very effective leaders and we didn't have to do this. 
we would be just following and helping. Unfortunately, we were not born at that time. We were born at a time where there is a big vacuum that we have to step in and fill. And I was not trained to be a Muslim scholar. But if, if this was taken care of, I would have been relaxed, I mean, and, and just be part of this. But unfortunately, we found a vacuum that we have no choice but to try to step in and fill it. Yes. In, in a way, obviously, everybody knows we have a serious problem individually uh, and, and, and the community and Muslims and stuff. Uh, but in a way, this, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, God knows that. God knows that we have a serious problem. It's not a, a, your problem individually or my problem or that. So we, we have a, a mission here or, or, or something to do. So everything that with your uh, with your uh, introduction and, and all of that, that's just like the executive summary. We all agree with it. We understand that. Now let's move on to the plan. Mm. Even just the people here in this room. Because we need to get out of here with something, not today, but uh, as in, in general. So the plan is, uh, what do we define as our system? Because I am not, I'm thinking about, I'm not going to be in influencing the people in Pakistan, or the people in Egypt, mm -hmm. or the people. Mm -hmm. So let's define our community. Mm -hmm. Maybe with just the people here to start, and maybe eventually, hopefully, will be a model to the rest of the Muslims in North America. Mm -hmm. And maybe by our position and our standing, improve the West image and so on. And that's, we keep getting, in, increasing our, our, our goal here. And define our system. What is our system? Let's decide what, need, what do we need to do. And please, we need to define, isolate what Abada by the five can and I bet that what, what we actually do to the community, mm -hmm. work, hard work. The first thing that comes to mind when I come to the mosque, my grass is better than the grass in this, in this mm -hmm. house mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The paint is better than the paint in this house mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. The way, the, there are no forks and dirt and, mm -hmm. you know, that is sad, and, you know, just individual things to be able to make things. Uh, so, so we need to have a plan. We need to have wh what? What do we do among us here? Maybe form uh, uh, groups to do X, Y, and Z, and, and, and move forward. Move forward to, to improve. Now that's that's exactly, inshallah, what we are we're gonna do. Now, as I said last time, and I said it in Juma, we are turning this from a class into a working group. Shall the next time probably even the setting will be different. So that we'll have a short probably introduction or reminder and then we're going to start talking about implementation, action plans, <coughs> etc. On how we can turn things around. I mean this change is not, uh, is not going to happen by itself. And Islam is not a theory. Islam has, there is a mission, there are goals, there is a model. Islam gives us all these tools. We just have to know how to simulate them to our reality so that we get the results that Islam promises all the time. So that's what we, where we are. We're making, and we mentioned that this is probably the best time. Because as we're emerging from Ramadan, alhamdulillah, full of energy and high spirituality, etc. That's probably the time uh, to make this transition, which is to turn this into a working group, minimize the lecture, the teaching aspect, and increase the planning, the planning and the action component, inshallah. But what's your power here? What's your power with the with the, the organization of, the, of this mosque? It has nothing to do with the mosque. And we're talking about working at the society at large. Well, I mean, we don't have to limit ourselves to work in within the walls of the mosque. And alhamdulillah, they give us this opportunity to, uh, but we should be thinking and doing. First of all, we're not going to replicate something that is already done. If it message is doing something, they're doing it. Good. So, but also we're talking about what can we do at the society at large. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to uh, the lack of leadership and the 
that we all acknowledge that. I think we have to accept that leaders are not given to us, they grow. They mate. They grow from small circles and they take the, the, the necessary steps to become leaders at large. So nobody denies that we don't have leaders, but we shouldn't expect them to be handed to us. They just grow amongst us. I, I read sometimes, uh, I read one time something very interesting. Uh, in the book of leadership that says every everyone is a leader waiting his opportunity and you have to think of people like this there is a potential in people it just the opportunity wasn't there to for that potential to be unlocked uh, everyone is leader waiting his or waiting for his opportunity so uh, um, there are talents uh, there are ideas, uh, etc. The problem now is they are scattered, they are not streamlined, and that's what we're trying to change. We're going to create a forum where, inshallah, that can allow us to leverage the talents and the skills and the ideas uh, of, of members of the community, inshallah. Anybody else? Yes. During your talks here, you mentioned about, you know, going back to our roots. <clears throat> what we see right now is like a failed, you know, movement. Um, you know, is this like the Salafis? Is this something like the Salaf movement in Islam that we should do? Oh, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. What I mean by going to the roots? Now, actually, that's probably exactly the opposite because I mean the Salafi mindset is basically go back to what was well, the work that was done before and just stick to it mm -hmm. and said so, talking about the roots are the roots and going back to the text and trying to understand it in the light of our reality that runs exactly the opposite because the, the, the traditional mindset among Muslims is to be um, very cautious, too cautious and very careful about the jihad and stick to the work that was done by people before us because they know better and they are better than us. So that's what the one that you mentioned. No, no, that's not what I mean at all. It's exactly the opposite. It's that we are not, we shouldn't be bound by this. We should go back to the text, the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of Rasulullah and understand them in the light of our reality, come up with New understanding of the deen. Fresh understanding. That will produce the results that are promised by this deen. And we should hold ourselves accountable. And as I said, this exercise, before Muhammad Wasallam, how does deen be, remained relevant? By prophets, messengers. New prophets. New prophets. With new message. New message. Customized for, that for those people and for that time. That's how, how this deen worked from Adam alayhi salam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Allah will send a new messenger with a new message that is customized to those people. Right. There is no messenger after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So how this deen is going to continue to be fresh and relevant and inspiring? It's our job right now. It's Muslims to come up with a new, not new deen, understanding. new understanding. New understanding, fresh understanding that is relevant to their time, that will achieve the same results. Because this deen, we say it is valid for all times and all places. Yes, that's why it came comprehensive and flexible. And basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the whole pharmacy. He used to send medicine, specific medicine for those people. Say this is what works for these people. Now they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the whole pharmacy. So our job now is to come up with the proper medicine or treatment for the special situation that we are, we are facing. That exercise was never done in the recent time at least. And that's no wonder why we are where we are. You want to build a community, that's where you start. And you use this understanding to build the community. And you know what? It's not one-time exercise. That fresh understanding, if it is done successfully, if it is done even, and it's not done, and if it is done successfully, there is still another task, which is what? To keep it fresh.
Because life is, is evolving. To keep it fresh how? To keep it fresh with those, with the two-way interaction between, actually three-way interaction. The text and the reality. You, you extract the guidance to try to improve reality. Reality will <coughs> face you with new challenges that will challenge you to come up with a new solution guided by, by the Quran and by the text. So it's a three-way interaction. There is a reality that has to be fixed and always brings new problems and new challenges. There is a guidance that is uh, that doesn't run out of solution. And there is your brain that you have to use. So this engagement will make this deen. We'll keep it always fresh, always relevant, and keep the life always improving. If we don't do that, what's going to happen? The detachment. Life will continue to evolve. Deen will lag behind. And when that happens, it becomes what? Becomes irrelevant. The reason in the 60s and 70s, the reason people abandoned this deen, because it became irrelevant. Because young people, when they go to the scholars in the mosque to ask them a question, they find them living in a different century. They don't know even what's going on. So you, when you are unable to answer my questions, when you are unable to solve my problems, of course I'm going to look for alternatives. Yes. Now, Brother Sahib, uh, today when I was coming to the mosque, I was listening to NPR, AD 5. And it was saying that there was a bombing in Baghdad in a predominantly Shia neighborhood, and 109 people were killed. And ISIS claimed that they did the bombing. Uh, I mean, since we are in America and we are dealing with ISIS and Shia, Sunni, all these things on a daily basis, uh, do you think it is necessary? If, you know, to at least talk about these things, a brief description, you know, of these different schools of thought, what is Shia, what is Sunni. Because I personally believe, you know, right now we live in a vacuum, and there are so many things that have to be discussed, but nobody is willing to talk about it. Well, I mean, talking about the Sunni and Shia is totally a waste of time. I mean, we're trying to solve problem that is for 1,400 years long and old, and it's not going to go away. And we just have to. And what I'm trying to do is basically to start focusing on or develop a vision or develop a project where everybody is going to contribute to it, regardless of their, regardless of what they think, and regardless of what their school of thought, regardless of their level of practice of this deal, etc. So it's people are driven by, by mission and by a vision they want to turn into reality. And we just have to accept our, each other because people are not going to change and these problems are not going to be solved. I mean, if we stay from here until the Day of Judgment to try to solve that problem that happened 1400 years ago and who's right and who's wrong, etc., we're not going to go anywhere. That's not what is, what's, what's, that's not the problem now. The issue now, as I said, is to think about what needs to be done and create the forum where everybody can contribute, regardless of what their beliefs and their fiqh and their private life and personal life, that's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I always think that the 100,000 that were people that were with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in... Uh, these are not all Umar al-Khattab and Abu Bakr Sadiq. And can, nobody can think that these are uh, Talib Nabi Talib. And no. But there, there was a project, there was a leadership, there was a vision, there was a movement, and it was open for people to contribute to it. And if you know the story of the, uh, the one with the, at the time of Sa'ad ibn Waqas, it was a drinker. The one, somebody was one of the very talented military leader يعني, or fighter يعني. and he was a drinker يعني. and that 
Sa'ad ibn al-Qas tried to prevent him from, from participating. The point I'm trying to make is, it's not the people, it's the job. It's come up with a vision and the sense of direction, lead people in a certain way. Yes, of course, we, wo we all love that all of us will be at the highest level of worship and the highest level of manner, but that's not going to happen. So the, 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 the approach is different. The approach now is trying to come up with a vision and a project that is open to everybody to contribute and accept our difference and manage them rather than keep focusing on our differences and try to eliminate them because they will never go away. I mean, uh, I saw a number of cases in this, in, in this country where you have uh, Muslims start as one community in a city. Very diverse, very inclusive. And then they split. They think that by splitting, problem will go away. After they split, among each group, new problem, new, problem, new division. It doesn't end. Why? Because we are different. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, these differences are not going to go away. We just have to learn on how to accept them and manage them. Manage differences. Let's get the brother and come back to it. I have a comment and a reflection, a correcting and a reflection. So the comment is, uh, tell my kids all the time, focus on what you can do, not what you cannot do. We, we can focus on so many things out there, whether we have leaders, whether it's Shia, Shia Sunni, uh, ISIS, and not ISIS. I can't influence any of these things. I can only influence what I can do. A reflection is on what you said. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent different prophets and different people have always struggled with this concept. Allah with his infinite wisdom knew that there's all these problems out there, so why send a customized message? And I finally came to the realization that the world itself wasn't that expanded back then. These problems were local, weren't spreading like they are today. Today, if a problem occurs here, in less than 30 seconds, you can be spreading the same poisonous idea somewhere else in the world. So this customized message came to these groups of people because they had these diseases. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew with His infinite wisdom that eventually things will get to where we are today. If, if this message did not come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would need to send probably 100,000 messengers today just to convey the customized message to the diseases that we have out there. So what, what are your thoughts? Actually, it's, um, um, it's, I agree. Um, part of it is because these problems were local and, um, and the, the world was not expanded, as you said, etc. But part of it also is the level of maturity of humanity. I mean, um, the humanity was not prepared to handle this job of giving you the whole thing, and just it's up, it's your job to customize it, etc. I mean, um, that probably was not the, these tools were not there before, because that's a, a huge jo job. I mean, if you compare it, the, the humanity was very primitive. That's probably the best way, is just to tell that group about their problem and what to do about it. But to give them at that time a full guidance and say, again, it's going to be preserved and your job is to keep it fresh and etc. Probably humanity was not also ready for it. So I think both. Part of it is uh, people were scattered and the pro these problems were very local. That's not the case anymore now. But part of it probably m m humanity did not mature to a point to take this big task of that basically I'm not going to be giving you a fish this is how you, you fish and then you, you do it it's your own That's, that transition after Muhammad وسلم, was big transition Now we, the more I think about it the more I say why we didn't focus on this there's big difference between sending customized messages and sending a comp comprehensive guidance that Allah promised to preserve and then give, assign you the task to keep it fresh and to keep it relevant. Yes. Yeah, Brother Sahil, um, the reason I mentioned this, you know, the, the Shia Sunni issue, when there is a problem, you know, sweeping it under the carpet, not talking about it is not going to help. There is an issue that has to be at least discussed. At least we should say these are the main issues. These are the main things that this school of thought is saying that's the main issue of this school of thought. You know, why this division? happened in Islam. As you know, better than me, Quran talks about Tariq, you know. Surah Yusuf is extensively the history of, you know, the Jews, right? So it's very important, I think, you know, that we should talk about the Tariq of Islam, 
this way, you know, we can find the future. If we leave this alone, if we do not touch it, the enemies of Islam in this time, and as you can see, we have a bloodbath, you know. Nobody is willing to talk about these things, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. No, no, don't get me wrong. Um, probably you were not with us early. Uh, I emphasize the importance of history. There is no way you can make future unless you understand your present time. Exactly. There is no way you can understand your present time unless you understand history. That's we know. But approaching history for lessons, not for argument, not of who's right and who's wrong. And no, no. Approaching history is good only for lessons. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً that in all the history is history is only good for lessons because if we're going to bring that history back and start the arguing who's right and who's wrong etc we're going to make the problem worse now we talked about history here we analyzed those situation even the civil war that happened early in the in history of Islam we talked about it remember we talked about even the reasons of it at least the way we we understood why it happened etc but the approach was for lessons, not to argue about it or to relive it or to judge, etc. It's just what lessons we can draw from that, from that, uh, from our history. So for us now, we are unable to solve the problem that are pressing. <coughs> are we going to leave this and go to try to solve the problem that is that has been there for centuries? Waste our time. Yeah, waste our time. So, uh, don't get me wrong, third about, th about third of the Qur'an is Qasas. So, it's, history is extremely important. You can't make future without understanding how you get to this point. But studying history just for lessons that can help you charting the future. That's all. I think it's, it's, uh, the problem is between, uh, between our belief as Muslims and I think all of uh, these people, whether uh, against or with, they, they believe in Islam. But it is the practice of Islam. The practice is not in a modern way. That is, we are talking about the uh, Western world and, and North America and Australia and the third world countries, which I call it backward countries, mm -hmm. where I come from. <laughs> so it's, uh, that practice we can, how do we uh, define and identify ourselves as Muslim in a very modern way? That's exactly what we have been trying to answer. And that's what we're trying to do here. Inshallah. That's what we're trying to do here, is to make our deen not lagging behind, actually leading life. And in the, the natural position of Islam, is to inform and guide and inspire life, not to lag, lag behind. But because we didn't do our homework, we allowed it to freeze so that now it's not now the... Almost every other nation now went way ahead of us. And now we're gradually becoming almost the exclusive backward part of the world. Gradually. I mean, recently yeah. there are... Asia, forget it. I mean, most of them are way ahead. And Vietnam, and it, the most recent, Vietnam. Vietnam was totally devastated. So now they're way ahead of most Muslim countries. Now there are African countries. Same. Quickly are moving. So we're moving, I mean, gradually to become the exclusive enclave in the world who are lagging, lagging behind. That's very serious. Why? Because, unfortunately, we, we, we transformed a very inspiring and empowering faith into crippling faith. We made this deed is one that is it's holding us back. It's not the deen. It's the way we understand it. Because this deen created a great civilization from a group of Bedouin people. In 23 years. Yeah. So the deen is not to blame. It's ourselves. So, uh, you're right, the question that you asked is exactly what we're trying to do, is to make this deen relevant again, inspiring. When you ask about why young people are not here, why youth, I always ask the, the, the opposite question, why should they come? 
I mean, what's in it here for them? I mean, why, what makes a young man come because to the... They're, they're, they're born and raised here in this country or other countries in England or uh, France or, or Belgium or whatever it is. They are indifferent, they are minorities in these societies. So it's easy to uh, preach on the Islamic societies and, and Saudi Arabia and Iran, Indonesia, all of this because the majority of the people are Muslims. And so it's easy to tell them about God and about the, all the principles of Islam and so on. But come to the practicality of, of the society which we live in here and other Western world, it's, it's, it's very hard. How do we get this religion that we love and we believe to come into the practice of the daily life? That's exactly there is I mean. the, There is a huge media you talk about. And TV is there. That's and the schools are there. I'm a teacher. I see this every day in, 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 in my life. And what do I do? I mean, is I have to accept it. No, 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 no. Yeah, accept. I'm a bad Muslim. <laughs> accept. No, no. Accept the fact that it happened, but not accepted meaning surrender. No. I know. No, we're not giving up. That exactly the question that you asked is. The reason why majority of young Muslims are not practicing and are not attracted to this faith because of our failure. Now we fail to make this deen inspiring and relevant for them. But now we're trying to fix that. We're trying to catch up. Because we have no doubt that the true Islam, if it is understood properly, our people will love it. And they'll be very proud of it. Why? Because this deen, as I said, is, is not modern. This deen makes civilization. This deen has the capacity, has the ability to do that. It just needs people who take it seriously and understand it, understand it properly. So what we're trying to do is to make up for deficiency for years that we didn't do our homework, is to come up with an understanding of Islam that will be very inspiring, very attractive, for young people. Why? Because it will become one, answer their questions, solve their problems, empower them to succeed in this life, etc. That's not the, now when they come to the mosque, that's not the message they get. Now when young people come to the mosque, that's not the message they, they, they receive. I mean, they get more confused even. So, exactly the question that you're asking is exactly what we're trying to do. There is no easy answer to this. But hopefully, if we put our heads together and with sincerity, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised those who try to guide their, their steps. So if, you, if we try to find the way that leads to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will, will guide us. And we'll make it easy. Subhanallah, I keep saying this that you think that. You know the Qur'an, and every time you come uh, through a verse, you read it as if first, for the first time. <clears throat> and yesterday, by chance, came through a couple of verses. One is, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةٍ كَثِيرَةٍ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And he, that many, in many times, in many cases, you have a small group who defeated much bigger group with the help of Allah. قالوا كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة كثيرة بإذن الله. and then the verse the other verse says قد كانت قد كانت لكم آية في فئتين التقطة فئة تقاتل في سبيل الله وأخرى كثيرة يرونهم مثليهم رأي العين يعني the the people there are two people two groups against each other those who are trying to do the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were perceived by the other group as double. They see them double in numbers. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is, at the end of the day, it's not you who's going to do the work. The, our ultimate aim is what? Objective. To be good instruments in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
يرونهم مثليهم يعني we have uh, 300 here I think about 1000 there they, they used to see them double their size uh, that's and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and then uh, another verse that is right says ومن نصر اللي من عند الله at the end of the day it's, it's going to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what is our job our job is one try to figure out the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is it that Allah wants to happen? That's an intellectual work. Second, try to do it or execute it to the best of our abilities. To be instruments that execute the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we do that, Allah will make things happen. Allah will utilize us to make things happen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilizes people with a certain criteria. Our job is to meet those criteria. Yeah. To be good, ha good instruments in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah will make... There is nothing difficult for Allah. But... Um, let's do our part. Again. To be... Uh, first of all to commit. To commit that we want to we wanna make it happen. And second, to do our, our best when it comes to planning and execution, etc. We shouldn't be just relying that things will work. No. But then, if you do that, and you, de you dedicate yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to utilize you, Allah will make things happen regardless of your numbers. Regardless, if that's all what you can do, if that's all what you can do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things happen. But that formula, you know, we missed it for a long time, which is try to figure out what needs to be done, do it to the best of your ability, and count on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make up for the, for the difference, for the gap. So inshallah, starting from next time, um, we'll even the setup, make it more like circle, so that we'll have a short lecture and then we're going to start really thinking and talking. As I said, um, we all need to own this. And I'm very confident that, inshallah, people uh, will come up with a lot of ideas and creative ways to implement these, uh, this vision and, and turn things around. It's never too late. It's a very, situation very serious. Um, we are trying to catch up. Uh, but as I said, uh, with this great faith, we should, should never lose hope. Uh, and and um, amazingly, and we were put in, in the spot. Because with Islam and being in, in this country, actually, it takes a lot of work to fail. The natural thing is to succeed. I mean, if you're a Muslim American, the natural outcome is for you to succeed. I mean, great faith and great country. You can't fail. I don't know how we, how, how we managed to, to, to fail but so far, but uh, the natural outcome is to succeed. Um, and we really have to have to start aiming high and, and, 
and push and challenge ourselves and let's abandon this uh, way of thinking of denial and excuses and settle for for the minimum and being uh, accept to be average and complacent no alhamdulillah we were designated for a, a big job allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has high expectation from us and we need to work hard to meet those expectation and to meet the profile that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, chose for us so that we get the results that he promised for us so there is a profile there is a requirement you meet those requirement and expectation you will get the results that are promised the last question is what's your vision about the new uh, the upcoming election as, as muslim what do you advise us uh, yeah. well the people are taking on step this is what it was so uh, that's a long story. Um, we are way far, unless we want to fool ourselves. Uh, our, our influence or our, the difference we're going to make in the presidential election in America is very minimal. Uh, it's uh, we still have a, l a long way to go until we become effective locally and we, we do things that are much easier than that. Then we can think about presidential election. But now we're basically watching. Yeah. We couldn't get one of our guys to be in the delegate in Northern Virginia. Hmm. One of our people tried to run the election. And the oh, yeah. Uh, what about next week? Do we have class next week or for the Sunday, yeah, sure. Sunday.